Okay, I think there's a, there's a lull in the action here. So my name is Ben Paul, Kunaknas Dityatan Raven Clan, uh, sharing our knowledge 2024. I'm the, uh, uh, Fred Paul is my uncle. And some of the, as I just said, some of the um, um, things that I'll sharing are just in passing, so that you can go back and study them. This is this is a uh, um, a presentation that's going to raise a lot of questions, and uh, hopefully we'll be thinking a lot. Um, as I was planning this. Um, presentation, I, I said, well, I haven't done anything on Fred Paul uh, in a long time, and I have a lot of information on him. So I went back and read his book, um, then fight for it. I hadn't read it in about 10 years, although I uh, did the cover for it and the, and, the, uh, and the back for it and other editing for the book when we published it and I read the original manuscript. and But as I got into the book again, I, I realized, well, this is why this is why we don't talk about it. I'll be right. Um, it didn't end well for Fred Paul. Um, but, and so I backed off a, a little bit and I said, well, I'll just spend time before the Alaska Native Claims Act stuff and, and all this uh, happened to him because the IRS did come back and they took everything. Uh, he had made enemies against people who control such things, all those DC lawyers and oil companies and lawyers, and they weren't backing off. They had him, and they got him. So we'll take a look at his life from a little different perspective. <clears throat> There's Fred there. There's Blair Jr. And this is uh, Francis, uh, Grandma Francis, author of uh, the Clingit uh, Spruce Root Basket uh, book and, uh, and also the Home Care of Tuberculosis, um, school teacher and uh, a good artist herself and uh, the author of Kataha, which is the childhood stories of this woman, Katliud Tilly Paul, at this time, she was Tilly Paul Tamry and winner of voting rights. First woman to become a Presbyterian deacon out here. But let me go back a little bit. We have uh, even older photos. In 1920, oh, William Paul moved the family back up to Alaska. This is, uh, I think, in Oregon, just before they came up. And uh, that'd be William Lewis Paul. That's Grandma Francis there. And that'd be my father, and that'd be Fred Paul. Little Fred. Fred was a good Boy Scout, commander of his troop. Is this Juno? Be. There's uh, the uh, Liberty Theater. It's a little too old for uh, no. some of us. Even for me, that's a little <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway, that's a bugle he's carrying. That's little, his little brother, Bob. Fred was a good, good big brother. Um, he liked to wear this visor and you like to look at the camera, which I think you will notice as, as uh, the slides go by. Um, that'd be my father, William Paul Jr. here, and that is Fred Paul. These are the beginning of the Ketchikan years, Ketchikan High School for both these guys. This one I like to uh, 
I, I, put, I gave a title to this one. It's called Every Good Klingit Knows. And uh, can anybody finish that? Every good Klingit knows that if you go swimming in the cold salt water, you get stronger. <laughs> and these boys are looking like, really? Really, you're gonna make me do <laughs> this? <laughs> so that'd be uh, my father there on the left and Fred on the right. And back to Ketchikan high school years. Then off to the University of Washington, Delta Todd Delta Fraternity House. I go by there every once in a while. And that'd be my father, William Paul Jr. there, and there's Fred on the end. How did they pay for it? They went fishing in Bristol Bay. That's the way you did it. Uh, it was a good, uh, my father had his uh, 30, uh, 35 millimeter camera by then, and there's a good set of Bristol Bay photos from that, from uh, 39 and 40. There's Fred, the coffee cup in the back. Does anybody know this man? Thought I might run into somebody with the... Uh... And then, hallelujah. This is the early text messaging here. That's what this is. Pass the bar exam, sworn in Wednesday, stop. Leave Saturday for wrangle, stop. Feel swell. Stop. Nine long years are climaxed Wednesday. Stop. Love to you all. Lawyer Frederick Paul. And what happened when he went back to Alaska? Well, uh, some of you know this story from watching the, the uh, documentary, um, The Land is Ours which we'll be showing on Friday, I think. And Larry Golden will be here to answer some questions. I'm looking forward to that. What happened when, um, in 1945, it was a big year for us. This is the law that he wrote. This is kind of fun to read, so I'm gonna read it. Section one, all citizens within the jurisdiction of the territory of Alaska shall be entitled to the full and equal enjoyment of accommodations, advantages, facilities, and privileges of public inns, restaurants, eating houses, hotels, soda fountains, soft drink parlors, tavern, roadhouses, barbershops, beauty parlors, bathrooms, rest houses, theaters, skating rinks, cafes, ice cream parlors, transportation companies, and all other conveyances and amusements subject only to the conditions and limitations established by law and applicable alike to all citizens. Penalties. Section two. Any person who shall violate or aid or incite a violation of said full and equal enjoyment or any person who shall display any printed or written sign indicating a discrimination on racial grounds of said full and equal enjoyment for each day for which said sign is displayed shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor and upon conviction there of shall be punished by imprisonment in jail for not more than 30 days or fine not more than $250 or both approved February 16th, 1945. Now, when I came to this part, I thought there's a lot, there's a lot there. And Elizabeth said her great words to the, to the legislature And my father, William Paul Jr., was the uh, Grand Camp uh, Secretary 
just previous to that. And this is November 1944. Of course, things happened uh, in February 45. I thought it'd be interesting to look at the the mindset of what was going on with people uh, at Cake. The uh, Grand Camp was at Cake that year. And uh, I would, that's my father, he was A and B secretary six times, and I encourage people to just take the time and read some A and B minutes. If you want to find out what your ancestors really cared about uh, for those years, because it was, it was everybody. It was, <laughs> one, one of the uh, resolutions for that year was this one. Title, discrimination, whereas the Indians of Alaska are discriminated against and are denied full and equal enjoyment of hotels, restaurants, transportation companies, and other public conveniences. For example, the transportation companies will not sell steamship tickets unless a full stateroom is occupied by Indians. Just kind of keep separate. It was resolved, Grand Camp of the Alaska Native Brotherhood in convention assembled in Cake, Alaska, that we petition the legislature of Alaska to enact the annex bill into law. And so they did. There's other, amongst the, um, the minutes are other little uh, gems that you can uh, pull out. Felix Cohen was a, a DC lawyer. He knew all the lawyers and they were looking for help for their own lawyers because they needed just more than just, uh, well, at this time it was just my father and William Lewis Paul, his father. So Washington DC for uh, competent lawyers in handling Indian Court of Claims cases Grady Lewis and Ed Wilkerson are being investigated in Alaska. It is hard to pick an experienced lawyer because they have not studied Indian law. Only my father did his law thesis on Indian land claims. It's what you do when you're gonna sue, get ready to sue somebody. You gather together all the information and then uh, you're prepared to Sock it to him, you know. He promised to have a Washington lawyer and possibly one from Alaska. Amy Hollingstead said that we should give our lawyers loyalty, stand up for, and back them up. They're of our race, so give them loyalty. Walter Sobolov said loyalty is worth more than money. Think loyalty and give our organization loyalty. Then Mrs. Thomas Bowman said, we work the attorneys to death, but yet we do not back them up. Hmm. Roy per Paradovich was uh, president that year and <clears throat> explained that outside help will be gotten, that Wilkinson and Roden will be uh, interviewed, that the present attorneys had agreed that chief counsel was immaterial, meaning that they didn't care if they got top billing or not. They just wanted to get things done. The motion to amend the motion that every effort be made to contact attorneys in Washington. And that carried upon main motion being put, then it carried in as amended unanimously. Treasurer Walter uh, a Sobolov reported at $40. I don't know what kind of lawyer you're going to get for $40. There's Amy Hollingstead. So let us get back to Fred. It'd be. Um, Uncle Fred, William Lewis Paul, and my father, William Paul Jr. Fred went on to be the attorney of record for the North Slope 
people. And remember, the North Slope people, that's where the oil was. That was the leverage. This is a Department of the Interior photo. This is the back of the photo. You can uh, see who's there. Uh, actually, Emil Nadi is uh, here with us. Is he in the room? Um, and he was part of the North Slope people, too. So what happened? Uncle Fred could have been really bitter about the whole, uh, the whole mess because he ha ended up having to sue his clients, the North Slope, Slope people, to, to get paid by them. And the government was canceled these contracts, uh, which they had approved uh, in 1966, I think. You can read the, the book and uh, find out a lot more details. But he ended up being so much in debt by the time the payoff did come for the Claims Act that he was essentially bankrupt. And he thought he saw a loophole in the, in the tax structure because they took the money they were paying to the Indians and, and paid the lawyers from that money too. So he thought, well, you know, this is, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a native, I can get out of this. And he had a lot of support uh, from a lot of people, uh, and, but it failed and I was pretty close to uh, uh, Uncle Fred at this time. He lived close by me in Seattle, and I worked on his car for him. And uh, we just, after my father died in 74, he, you know, took me aside a, a couple of times and to know how I'm doing, you know. Uh, but here's the thing. It's almost impossible to feel bitter when you're surrounded like this. This is a, his son Steve's house. Looks like Christmas. This kid is sitting right over there. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. And I think I'll leave that part. Well, there's one more part here for uh, the Presbyterians. Um, I wasn't sure that they knew about this particular um, uh, rather old uh, publication, um, but there was one that they did on uh, Fred Paul. I'll just read a piece of it here. Um, it was quite natural that Eskimos, so they hadn't learned to call them by their real names yet, but through Paul should turn the to the United Presbyterian Church for support. Their historic loyalty to the church is exceeded perhaps only by the Scots. Oh, that's saying a lot. And it was natural that the United Presbyterian words supporting native rights should multiply from the congregation to the General Assembly, beginning in 1971, Assembly at Rochester. Uh, at one time, grins Paul today, the oil companies had 60 lobbyists at work, one for each member of the Alaska legislature, and there I was, a little pipsqueak lawyer from Seattle trying to fight the whole shebang. And the Presbyterians came, came you know, back their words with money on request of the 4,500 4, Eskimos of the ASNA and Paul, grants of 10,000 and 85,000 were made in 70 and 71. Uh, the f four Eskimos came from Point Barrow after the payoff and, and paid it back. That's very nice. Those grants were crucial in our struggle to victory, says Paul today, adding that they restored a sagging faith in my church. He was a member of uh, Seattle's Wedgwood Presbyterian Church. The whole article is uh, there. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and come at this from a, a little different angle um, because of things that have happened this year. The first thing was uh, um, 
made me think it might be time to talk about things we don't like to talk about. And that these things, if we're on the path to healing, we got to go through them. They're our own, our own mistakes. And the first thing was the restorative justice project by the Presbyterian Church, which um, we're going to hear about uh, from um, a couple of other speakers uh, uh, later. Um, sorry, Jacqueline, I had to get your name up there because you had a good part in it. <laughs> Uh, published a good booklet on there. It's it's uh, well written. Um, Walter's Church. Now, these are my views. I haven't. I'm not speaking for either Jocelyn or or any Presbyterians. I'm just giving you my views because I know. Uh, Presbyterian theology and my Bible real well and, and uh, uh, in my view the restorative justice is the repentance to use their terminology of the Presbyterian church at the prompting of a concerned group from Juno and others to correct a wrong that happened to the Clingett Memorial Presbyterian Church of Juno in 1963. The Presbyterians became convinced that they had been a stumbling block Stumbling block is a um, another biblical term that uh, says if you get in the way of somebody's well-being or, or their faith, um, don't do it. Very strong language is used uh, in the Bible uh, about not doing that to this church. It was their own church, and according to their sacred writings of the Bible, they must attempt to make amends. And I say attempts here because... Repentance is not an easy thing to do. When so much time has gone by, it, it can take some working out. And the Paul family, we lived in Juneau. We went to uh, Walter's church. Uh, Paul, the Bill Paul family and the William Paul Sr. families. The Sobolovs were family friends. We were quite aware of the success of this church that got closed down. Um, the sign says, our boys are on the front defending our freedom, a freedom to worship. Here's Walter. God, he's Overalls on. I don't know what he's working on. <laughs> There's uh, my father took uh, wedding pictures. Um, I have to look up to see who that is. But if anybody recognizes uh, somebody, speak up. So now the, the other thing that happened this year was this. The publication of Sakwa by Box of Knowledge. There's the uh, title pages there for you. Um, Sakwa is the story of a Haida man who was sold into slavery and ended up a slave to a Klingit man. Sakwa wanted an official piece of paper that said he was no longer a slave and so sought the court system for help. Some of his story got recorded in writing. Um, uh, there's a statement in... Uh, the Land is Ours, the film that has uh, just stuck with me over the years. And it's, uh, 
A man convinced against his will is still of the same opinion. Um, we'll get back to those things. Um, yeah, Lauren. Oh, yeah. Putting that in context in the film, uh, uh, Fred was talking about his own father who uh, loved to debate uh, a little bit too much, I guess. And uh, he could debate so strongly that he that turned into a contest of wills rather than a seeking of a solution to a given problem. Um, the phrase is not new with Fred. I think it's uh, attributed to Carnegie a lot, but it's not new with him either. Um, a man convinced against his will is still of the same opinion expresses the universal truth, something that has always been true, all races, everywhere, for all time. You've probably been in the situations where uh, you've had to try to convince somebody who just didn't want to do something. Now, the great example of this is the Civil War which briefly, the English, who were the greatest perpetrators of slavery on earth, began to have a change of heart, a change of will. Uh, around 1800, you can read a um, biography of William Wilberforce uh, if you wanted to know how that happened in England. They abolished the slave trade in 1803 and slavery altogether in 1833. This thinking traveled to the U.S., to the northern states, where the economy wasn't so dependent on the cheap labor force of slavery. The North began to debate with the South states to no avail. Push came to shove, as they say. Shots were fired. Hundreds of thousands of people died. After the war, if you could have gone to the plantation owners, the slave owners at that time, and ask them what they thought of slavery, how many do you think would say they were wrong in owning slaves and would try to make a repayment? Maybe none. And now they would hate us even more because we killed their sons. Who can forgive that? They have been convinced against their will, and they are still of the same opinion. And so the slavery lives on. It just changes form. Segregation, lack of education, lack of the best land, lots of ways. A terrorist organization is formed to keep the slave in line. We still live with it today. Now back to the Klingon. The book Sakwa lists in its um, selected sources Aboriginal slavery on the northwest coast of America. That book refers to all the old anthropologists and others who came to our land several generations ago. I had read virtually all the books that they listed because I got <laughs> I got them from my grandfather in his book collection. Swan, Boaz, Emmons, Krauss, Garfield, Oberg, Olson, Drucker. He corresponded with, with some of them. <clears throat> the missionaries wrote their books, including his own mother, Tilly Paul. Tilly grew up in Wrangell. <coughs> During her childhood there from 65 to 81, she had slaves. And the Klingit owned slaves. Well, but what happened to us? We don't want slaves anymore. This was different. What changed the will of our ancestors. One book that might be a little bit <clears throat> obscure, though I don't think it should be, is um, uh, this publication, Sketches of an Excursion to, South, to Southern Alaska <clears throat> by Reverend A.L. Lindsay. My, pub, my copy of it is uh, a facsimile copy that's by uh, the Shorey Bookstore. They made 100 of them in 1965. There are some originals around. But he takes a trip to uh, um, 
to wrangle. And he records a lot of things that were said there. And you do have to take um, missionary writing into, uh, well, you, have, you have to be careful with it sometimes. Sometimes it's just a search for glory. Sometimes it's, it tells the truth. The first white people that came, oh, this is Toyot's speech. Uh, he was a Ankawu in Wrangell at the time. And the first white people came among us, had white skins and black hearts. They were wicked men. They taught us many evil practices. They spoiled our children, bought or stole our daughters, and soon cast them off. They robbed and poisoned and murdered us. We thought all white men were alike and that we would soon perish under the white man's lust and our own folly and madness. But we found out that there was a difference among the whites. Some came who did not try to eat us up. We found out the cause of the difference when you sent missionaries. Now we learn to love ourselves and to do good, even to our enemies. We learn God's will and try to do it. We know, now we know you treat us as brethren. And again, thank you for coming to see us. Another speaker there was the Shustak uh, from Wrangell. And this is what Lindsay says about Shustak. Brother Young added remarks in Chinook, explaining Dr. Kendall's connection with the board. They had long before understood my relationship to them. I felt most desirous to have a good word from a Shustak. He is a man of patriarchal dignity, and by reason of age, his authority is greater than that of Sheikhs. I probably, I don't know. He spoke with a tone and gesture of a man who was accustomed to be obeyed and with oratorical skill. He began, I want first to thank you for what you have said. You have come a long way to see us and we believe what you say. When Mr. Young came, I was not pleased because he would not do what I wanted him to. I wished him not to turn my people away from the old customs, and I opposed him for interfering with us. <clears throat> I wanted my people to learn new ways to make them strong and to keep the old dances and ceremonies because we and Indians of other tribes have always practiced them. White people have their ways, so have clingets, and it is not seemly for Indians to give up their practices and adopt other peoples. Remember, this is uh, Lindsay's uh, recording of this. I think I forgot to say that um, Lindsay was the uh, uh, pastor based in Oregon, and he was in charge of the mission outreach uh, in Oregon and Washington and the new Presbyterian outreach into Alaska just prior to Sheldon Jackson. But you tell us that we must change some things. I begin to believe it. And that, I think, is the touching of the will right there. The decision is made and yeah, white people are just wiping us out, but not all of them. There are some that are different. I begin to believe it. I want my people to be prosperous and happy I shall consider what you have said. You will teach the children many things. I shall not oppose it. Mr. Young means to do us good, and I shall not stand in his way any longer, but I want to observe the ancient rites and customs. We want our children and their children to stay in this land as long as tide flows and sun shines. 
and our opinions changed without bloodshed. Well, I have some uh, questions for uh, further discussion because I'm I'm sure that uh, it's it's a lot to think about. Um, there's the glory of conquering cannibals. That was uh, that was you know you're right back home. You, if, you, if you've got a cannibal, uh, people you believe are cannibals and you can conquer them, then uh, well, you're measured by the, the size and greatness and power of your enemies, aren't you? And uh, well, there's something about in the S in Sheldon Jackson book and Father Duncan, Duncan and Peter Simpson too, which is quite interesting. Um, education and healthcare, the Presbyterian way. And here's a question which I don't see too much. How has reading and writing changed Klingit society? The choices were learn to read and write or keep speaking Klingit. We, we take the reading and the writing uh, so for granted these days that uh, these were missionaries who were coming in contact with people who could not read or write. There was no reading and writing in Klingit. Even today, we use English letters to write out Klingit. We're, and it and it's a it's a good thing. It's working out. We're spending time with our scholars, and and uh, we're recording in writing our language. But it is a changed language because it's a written language. Since since the Klingon don't want slavery anymore, why bring it up? Well. The, uh, yeah, why bring it up? Why publish this book? The, uh, um, what are we doing for time here? Okay. Um, the restorative justice uh, book is is another example of people who are <coughs> convincing other people to do something without going against the will of the people. It's a good example of how things can work out. Um, I look forward to, uh, to hearing more about how it's going. They already came up with a lot of money those Presbyterians, I think it was a uh, million dollars or something. Wasn't it? Pretty hard to tell what to do with that million dollars, though. So back to Uncle Fred, and we'll leave it with that. Uh, it's my favorite picture of him the four generations. Over to questions. What yes. do they mean by restored, restored, uh, restoring justice? Restorative justice is what they're calling it. They published this nice book. Do you want this book? You can have this book. I have two other copies. Yes. Um, we have about 90 copies. Well, she's got 90 copies, but... I remember hearing that uh, when Walter's old office, you know, as he hitchhiked back to get his education, hitchhiked on the trains in his story, and uh, when he first started as a minister there, his church was empty. Yeah. And he kept on, he kept on, he kept on until the native people start coming to church. 
Mm-hmm. And then when I read when I went to college and was learning about the cricket, uh, the way the crickets lived uh, uh, all the time, it told about their uh, the way they had their royalty, they had their royal families, they had their slaves, they had uh, mm-hmm. all that, and uh, they, uh, and then my grandfather, Chester Worthington, James Johnson, when President Harding came to Wrangell, they left his, President Harding's wife behind, and my grandfather had to row her out to the boat, so she told President Harding, we are not like you. We don't want to hurt anyone. We just thought we would bring this fine lady back to you. <laughs> That's a funny story. But they did have a, a system where they had slaves, all right, and then yeah. they had lower class, higher class, and the chief shapes were the leaders, you know, mm-hmm. and all that. So I was just wondering what they meant by restored justice. Well, go to the next, uh, I'll let the Presbyterians uh, talk about that. Because <laughs> it's not easy to, 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 to repent. As I said, you got, to, you want to pay some money, you want to apologize. They did a beautiful apology that was uh, online. There, and all the big, big wig Presbyterians came out and did a good job. You got to. You can't just be words, though. You have to. Uh, and they're coming up with some money. Let's hear what they're going to do. Anything else? Yes. Um, it seems like you. Your family's pretty. <laughs> what did you? What did you end up doing? I'm curious. I don't know. Maybe I missed oh. the beginning. And who are you? And what are you doing? Uh, uh, because you, you seem to be some pretty interesting people. Yeah. Well, um, I'm only. In- Eighth Klingit. My uh, the men kept marrying Scottish women, and uh, starting with Tilly, <laughs> but uh, uh, actually t- starting with Tilly's mother, she married uh, James Kinnon. But um, uh, after we moved down to Seattle in '53, grew up in the north end of Seattle. Um, had an adult conversion as a Christian when I was 21. Went to uh, very strict Bible church. Uh, they had a gym that you could play basketball in, and uh, that was very attractive. But because um, it is the greatest game ever invented. But um, <clears throat> um, grew up there. Ended up in another church. Uh, went to college, uh, Bible college, uh, and uh, ended up with nine years of of uh, college, but uh, including a couple at the University of Washington, yes. <laughs> Katie uh, Budmark used just walk in the door, so. Um, and we do stuff in, uh, well, we had a naming ceremony in uh, 95. Klingit name and ceremony down in, in Seattle, and uh, my Klingit name, uh, Kunak Nasti, was given to me and something clicked on him. And I knew that my parents, grandparents, great grandparents had all this information that that needed to be looked into and I just it's just taken years and years to go through. I'm still going through it. The archives are just enormous with the three lawyers in the family. They say everything. <laughs> I've tried to to list uh, who took what picture, William Paul Jr. photo. That that's uh, one of six thousand photographs he took you know, from uh, 1940 to 1953. Yes. Ganesh, thank you for your presentation and bringing your your good spirit and your work here. These are very important words and a very important study of important people who have influenced and and changed the direction of for our people. As we view these things and we come together this week, there's such an intelligence 
right here on this very this very ground that would that people came together, including the women with the men, of course. Um, to make decisions, hard decisions at the time, but as they had a focus and knew what it was they were focusing on, such as land rights, our way of life, some things they say um, were put aside in your presentation, and I understand that. Um, this is my mother, Harriet Leal, and she is the granddaughter of Chester Worthington, um, Annie Worthington Dachua, after our great, my great-grandfather Chester Worthington passed, who was very close to the Pauls, as you know. Um, they all worked together, and there's many descendants of ANS and A&B here in the room also, and I'd like to acknowledge them. But there's such an intelligence that they went about their work and they had a focus and a purpose, and I'm sure that it was um, very difficult times. Blood was shed on this land right here. There were many things that took place in the name of education and spirituality. However, they seemed to find a way to be honest and true to what they believed instinctively. And as we go forward, the question comes, what do we believe collectively, spiritually, intellectually, what are we willing to fight for today? Um, in, in listening to our esteemed, one of our esteemed leaders of the Chuka last last night, he was very sad in his statements about our food and our land, and he was still hopeful for our language. And I think, and it was spoken a couple of times, even if you know one thing, get word, you, you are releasing that word into the air and into the universe. So I think as I come into this circle and on this land, what is it after a century that they would have us fight for today? There are many things that we know that we could stand up and that we, fight, that we do come together. Um, locking arms is what they did at that time. I know when I was a little girl over here at Indian River, I was one of the littlest ones with my cousins, and we were going to, across the river, and they, my cousins were bigger, so their feet were longer, and my feet went up, and I was like this, and I was floating down the river, and they pulled me to the other side, but um, because I was a little girl, and they were bigger than I, but we locked arms, and that's what we need to do today, is lock arms for what it is that we want. We come from different places, but we're all the same. So in the spirit of, of your father and your family and all of those that are present, um, if I may be so bold, I, I see in the hearts a uh, saying, what is it that we are fighting for today? And I think our elders have clearly defined that. But how do we pick up those tools in a intricate um, and an esteemed way. One of the elders said that there were three classes of people, mm -hmm. and some spoke common, and then there was a middle, and there was a higher caste people, and they spoke in a certain way. So I think of your presentation and other presentations in our collective history, and my question to you, um, just for thought, is what would the founding fathers and mothers say to us today? Um, it is hearing that voice on this land at this time means moments of quietness walking this land to hear what it is, but I know that it's powerful and it's strong, and we need to make no apologies for who we are, how we walk, the land that we're from, and what is inherently ours. But how do we go about that next battle into the new century? Um, I have thoughts, but I'm wondering your thoughts. Or your thoughts. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was good. Um, <coughs> Shishtak's uh, speech, he says there, uh, but I want to observe the ancient rites and customs. We want our children and their children to stay in this land as long as the tide flows 
and sun shines. And it's that's that's right. Uh, okay, but we have to change some things. We simply just have to. That's what I that's what I want to do. I think he's still got a, a point in a street named after him in Wrangell. <laughs> yes. You know, I was happy when they started this, uh, the closest thing to what uh, Andy Hope the third won uh, Tribal College. Because mm -hmm. I remember him talking about that a lot. But I worked with her both in Anchorage because I raised my kids up there. And, uh, Herb was head of BIA housing, so he traveled all over. But he always told us we had a hard time getting together as Click and Haida and A and B, A and S. He'd say, well, you should just go ahead and get together and get as many as you can. And we didn't have a home, so we'd go from place to place to have our meetings and uh, bring up the convention and everything. But uh, Andy had that vision of a college, and that's what he was focused on. And he put together that big, big sheet that tells you all the different plans and every, him and I don't know who else, but um, that was his dream, you know. And I was very happy when they started this because uh, we didn't learn, you know, our, grandch our grandparents didn't teach us, but uh, I remember William Paul in A and B Hall there, right in the middle of the floor, talking to the Brotherhood Sisterhood, and he was pleading with them, don't hold corporations, he said. A few people will get rich, and the lawyers will get rich. But uh, he said, put the land in tribal trust, he said. That would be the best thing, you know. And, yeah. I think our people didn't understand, you know, didn't know anything about corporations those days. But I remember he was crying when he was saying it. And I was only about 10 or 12 in college bird. We were washing the dishes in the kitchen. And I ran to the dog and he elicited it. But he was sure right, you know, the, he was right. But he voted against it. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're, uh, I don't want to. Uh... So I hope this college for the, can continue in the, the enthusiasm of the people. Because I couldn't learn it now, it was too hard. I dropped out two times. <laughs> it's too hard for me to learn. But it's really great. Finding your way through the all the different clash of culture stuff is is really it's really kind of almost miraculous in a in a way because we're still here. <laughs> Didn't disappear. We're changed. Yeah, we're changed. But we're still here and talking and working things out. That's uh Maybe we could go, go to fishing in Bristol Bay. <laughs> well, thanks for coming. Any other questions? Um, I'll be around for three days.